Virginia and, and Peter, welcome. Welcome home. Welcome back to another Sunday service here. But this is a special service. And when you said I was coming over, I better hat. I weren't. You know, <laughs> <so>. <laughs> oh my. Well, I tell you what, he's got all kinds of jokes. And you probably hear a few of them today. But, uh, but no, it is such a thrill and an honor to have you. We love you guys. And, you know, we've been in this series called Setbacks. And I just know that in a crowd this size, we all endure things. It's not a matter of if, it's simply a matter of when. We're going to have some di disappointments, some setbacks, some unexpected things that come into our lives. And I think one of the biggest tragedies sometimes is when somebody has a setback. It could be a relationship, a divorce. It could be maybe a loss you know, of a family member. It could be you know, a financial setback or loss, you know, a job situation. The list is endless, a health setback. And regardless of what kind of setback is, unfortunately, a lot of people never overcome. They allow those setbacks to rob them of what could be or should be, or allow them to maybe hold on to resentment or anger or bitterness because of the circumstances and the pain that they endure. But God, because who he is and his faithfulness, has the ability to help us overcome and actually experience a comeback if we'll let him. I can't think of two people who have endured more than the two of you, and yet you've allowed God to enable you with a remarkable comeback story. So if anybody can relate today to overcoming, if anybody can relate to dealing with circumstances in our lives, especially circumstances you didn't ask for, circumstances that you perhaps um, would even be safe to say that they were not your fault. It's just... For whatever reason, it's the circumstance that you had to face in your life. And so I just shared um, with everybody, we'll start with you, Peter. Um, you know, obviously the accomplishments that you have received, um, obviously through the military, um, as well as, you know, even in your career with different companies that you have worked with and are continuing to work with. And, um, but your life forever changed um, in Vietnam. And you were serving as a 19-year-old young man. And so with that, I'm going to let you share the upcoming events and the things that unfolded that, that radically changed your life. So tell us about that. Well, like you said, I was uh, in Vietnam at the age of 19 serving with the 25th Infantry Division. Um, and on the 22nd of May of 1969, um, we were out on patrol and we got ambushed. And about five minutes later, I was hit with two bullet rounds on my right side and one on the left. Uh, but I was still able to stand up and try to get to the tank uh, because we were having our, our lunch at, the, at that time and they surrounded us. Um, as I was going to the tank, I stepped on a, on a mine. So it, it wasn't my day. <laughs> stepped on a mine and uh, I lost my legs instantly. What you see is, uh, exactly the way I came out. I didn't, they didn't have to do any surgery. Um, and that was, to me, probably the biggest setback that anyone can ever have. Uh, but making the comeback uh, was also very, very difficult. Uh, because when you make a comeback, uh, it depends on how you make that comeback. Uh, I was at Valley Force General Hospital in Pennsylvania, and there were almost 500 uh, soldiers there who lost limbs. That's why we were all sent. Um, and every one of us had to make a comeback. And everyone did, but not everyone made the right comeback. Uh, when you suffer something to the magnitude that I suffered, and you come back home and you start to drink and you feel better, that's a comeback, but it's the wrong comeback. Mm -hmm. Or you can get into opioids. That's another uh, comeback that is not the right comeback. Uh, I hated God. I couldn't hear anyone tell me about God because I thought that he'd let this happen to me. But back in 1971, two years after I got back home, uh, through an 11-year-old little girl. Hmm. 
her persistence, who told me about Christ. And she just did not give up on me. Until one Sunday when I was sick and tired of this little girl, I told her, listen, if I go to church with you this Sunday, would you promise to leave me alone for the rest of my life? <laughs> and she said, okay. Probably thinking if he doesn't accept Christ, I lost him. But that Sunday was when I made the real comeback. Mm -hmm. That's when I accepted Christ into my life. And, and everything just changed. My, my, I mean, my life took a 180. I mean, it, it completely, completely changed. Uh, the bad thoughts, the bad dreams, the, 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 the bad comebacks, because yes, I had those drinking problems as well. Uh, like every other little of my life, today I, I, don't, I just don't have a, a taste for it. God took away that taste for, for, for liquor or for opioids or forever it might be. And I accepted Christ fully in my life. Because when you make that comeback and you accept Christ, you, got, you have to accept it fully. You have to let them come in and you have to let them make that change. Uh, but after coming back, I went back to school. I studied uh, weight and balance for airplanes, and I went to work for United Airlines, um, and I received their highest award, the uh, Employee of the Year. I was with them for 12 years. Uh, and back then I went, I opened up my own uh, business. I opened up a Christian bookstore in New York. That was a very lucrative business back then because there was no internet. Now, now you can get anything you want on the internet. Uh, and then, uh, in 93, uh, my wife and I decided to move to Florida. And I went to, I went to work as a, re a realtor for a little while, but after seven years, I went to work for Disney. I've been with Disney for almost 22 years. And I've been with the Festival of the Lion King show for 16 of those years. So if you're ever at Disney, look me up and get a front row seat. Uh, <laughs> but life, uh, life was good. I mean, uh, with Christ, life was good. And um, in Luke chapter 8, verse 39, uh, after Christ went around this city and, and took the demons out of a young man, this young man wanted to follow him. And he said, no, I want you to go and tell the world what God has done for you. And that's what I, that's what I did. I went out and I, I've been all over the United States and abroad uh, telling people what God has done for me. And uh, the biggest pain that I've received is giving my testimony and seeing people come to Christ. Seeing people with problems, seeing people who are going through a, a bad marriage or going through alcoholism or going through drugs or whatever it might be, coming to Christ. That's my payback. And there's been thousands of those. Mm -hmm. And you know what? God took away my legs, but he gave me eternal life. Mm -hmm. And I think that I got a better way to do it. You mentioned, uh, my wife and I have three daughters, and real quick, just stand up, the three of you. <laughs> They're back there, come on, I know you got Come on, girl, I'm there. Yeah. You know, and the, uh, the reason that I asked them to stand up is so that you can see how beautiful they are, just like their father. <laughs> but look, that, that's another gift that God has given to us. That's another another comeback. Amen. You know, that's, a, that's like the uh, having a, a cake and it's really good, but you put that cream on top of it, it'll stay on the cream. That's great. That's great. Well, obviously, you've endured so much. And so through all, I mean, obviously, you didn't even go into, you know, the second half of, you know, all that you had to go through with surgeries and, the, you know, just the recovery and the restoration and really just learning how to adapt to a new life. You know, just the adjustments that you had to make. And then obviously, once you got married, and um, really just uh, Virginia, obviously you had to adjust your world, you know, around Peter, and just, you know, from the mobility aspect of all of the things, you know, that obviously a family like yours has to make adjustments for. But with that in mind, um, and by the way, I think there were some photos of you back in the younger days there when you were a soldier and so there he was. Good looking guy. Yeah, you were a good looking guy there. And uh, so those were um, the days that obviously he served and a part of the, um, was that the platoon that you were a part of? 
That was, uh, we called ourselves the Fantastic Five. The Fantastic Five. That's we, awesome. We got to Vietnam together, and uh, the one on the right-hand side in the front, he's, he passed away of cancer. And the one right behind him is Eddie Plez. Uh, he passed away as well. And the one all the way on the right is uh, Jimmy Hip, but we call him Hippie, and that's the real Rambo right there. And the uh, one in the back is uh, Steve. He lives in San Francisco, and the good-looking guy is me right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, what an incredible, you know, legacy from the standpoint of, you know, obviously what you did to serve, but yet what you had to endure because of the setbacks that you've overcome. And as I stated, moving forward, you know, life began to, to progress. God brought you a beautiful wife. You have a beautiful family. And life seems to be moving forward. And so all of a sudden, we're going to put the, put the spotlight on you here, Virginia. But all of a sudden, as life is moving forward, and there was a day that took place. In fact, last week was the three-year marking period, if you will, or anniversary of something horrific and tragic that happened in your world. And so you were coming home one day from work, just like normal, and I'm going to let you tell the story from this point moving forward. November 7th marked the, you can say anniversary, I call it the anniversary celebration of life because God gave me an a chance to still be here, and I thank God for that. Um, I want to thank my church, just we think. I want to thank all of you, I want to thank my pastors, because your prayers helped, and your prayers kept me here. Don't, don't ever give up. Just don't think that, oh, I'm praying and I see nothing happening. I'm here. Mm -hmm. It was a sunny day, 2.30 in the afternoon. I'm off of work. I'm driving home on 417, and I was just shy of the Lake Nona exit. On the other side, going south, was a, an 18-wheeler semi-truck. And we really don't understand. We don't know what really transpired, how it happened. But we do know that he lost control of his truck, crossed his lanes, crossed the median, and hits me. I get caught up in the whole accident. Um, I don't remember how it happened. I don't remember exactly seeing it. But in between, as I was in the hospital, my girls remind me that I did comment to them. And I did make a comment saying, I saw it coming. I can't remember that. But they say I said that, so clearly I must have still been in that moment that I could remember. I also made, to, made a mention to them that I said, it was not my fault, which is, coincides with your message today, Pastor. It wasn't my fault. It just happened. I was there. And got caught up in the accident. We'll put it in perspective. We actually have a picture here. So um, obviously it was all over the news and um, I remember getting word very quickly. You were airlifted to the hospital and through this horrific situation, so imagine an 18 wheeler basically coming to the other side of the road that you're traveling. So, you know, he's going southbound, you're heading northbound. He crosses the median, lost, lost control of the 18 wheeler, and basically jackknives, and she gets caught in the middle. And so, through this horrific, you know, uh, crash, and obviously you can see um, just the devastating impact that was made to the car and then ultimately to her. So, you're not just, you didn't just break both of your arms and both of your legs, but your arms and your legs were crushed. Yes. And so here you are, and I remember going to the hospital and seeing, you know, you were literally laid up. I think there is a picture here too of uh, when you were in the hospital bed 
And I remember just seeing you basically in a place of just, in many respects, just uh, being confined to that bed. And through multiple surgeries, you've been through how many surgeries now? Up to May 28th of this year, 10. So 10 surgeries. And just all that that, um, all that that involved, multiple, multiple, I remember you talking the other day and about all the screws <laughs> that were part of those surgeries and that and not only had to put screws in there, it put you back together, but then through some of those surgeries started removing some of those screws and you said you even have those in a little plastic bag there. And, and what's crazy is that through you know, that horrific tragedy through the multiple surgeries and then through the recovery process. You were in the hospital for how long and how many days of recovery? Um, I was in the hospital initially for 14 days and in between them trying to patch me up and put me together and get me going. Um, because when it happened initially, my family, they're contacted, they go to the hospital, they couldn't see me until about 9 p.m. that evening. They were just trying to patch me up, trying to get me kind of like somewhat together. Um, was there for 14 days. After that, I went to a rehabilitation center. I was there for a month and a half, of which um, you're talking Thanksgiving is coming. And my family's life was turned upside down. Mm -hmm. So here we are celebrating Thanksgiving in a rehabilitation center and my family they took the turkey there <laughs> but they had to they had to feed me because yeah. basically this is one of the better pictures actually but um I couldn't bring anything to my mouth I couldn't so they had to take care of me and that's where Thanksgiving was that year um Christmas day we celebrate Jesus, and he gave me the best gift, which was sending me home. He let me go to my mother's house where I was there for four months, and basically, she took care of me all over again. So I was her first, I'm her firstborn, and here she is, mom taking care of her baby all over again. She had to feed me, do everything, because I, I couldn't walk. And I couldn't move. My mom is 76 years old, and you're supposed to be taking care of your mom. So for me, that was really, really hard, because here I am laid up, and mom's taking care of me all over again, because I couldn't do it. One of the things that you enjoyed doing prior to this accident, in this day that forever changed your life, was like anybody else. You enjoyed being outside, you were active, you were skydiving, you went skydiving, you ran marathons, you were an avid runner, and now all of a sudden, the things that you enjoyed the most were suddenly taken from you. And now you've been rebuilding your world physically, just making, you know, and then, and we hadn't even gotten into the, we think about what they've had to endure, not just physically, but, I mean, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, all the things that obviously are sometimes even harder to come, you know, to, to overcome, you know, than just even the physical. And yet you've endured and you've pushed through. And even though there was a moment where they didn't know whether you were going to live or die when they airlifted you to the hospital, there was no guarantee that you were going to make it. But God had a different plan. And through that plan and through that purpose, not just for you, but for you, Peter, as well, now together have a comeback story. You know, as a pastor, I talk to a lot of people who have incredible setbacks in their life, but they remain bitter. They remain angry. They're angry at what somebody did to them. They become a victim. They hold a grudge or maybe resentment. They become bitter because of how, you know, what, what, what life has handed them. And so, so often people want to point that or redirect that anger, you know, or hostility towards God and blame God for their situation, their circumstances. 
And you know, I, I would say, be safe to say on any human you know, level, any natural in the natural, it would only be right to maybe for somebody to direct their emotions in that way. But yet, how did you overcome those emotions? Because you had every right. You mentioned a few moments ago, Peter, you know, a lot of people come back, but they come back the wrong way. And they, they, they take it, you know, and, and you know, try to escape the drugs, alcohol, whatever dysfunctions that might be to cope with their pain. But yet, both of you rose above that. And tell us how you would recommend to somebody who has gone through the pain of a loss, a setback, maybe through a relationship, a divorce, maybe something that somebody did to them. Maybe it could be abuse. It could be anything. How would you encourage somebody and what would you tell somebody when it comes to overcoming whatever emotional limitations that maybe the enemy wants to use to keep them defeated? Um, it's easy to become bitter. It's easy to become angry. And like you said, Pastor, it's easy to point why me. I thank God because I, I didn't ask why me, but that's only because God was my strength. He was there. I was able to forgive. Surprisingly enough, some people are like, well, what about the truck driver? You know what? Shortly after, I was able to forgive the young man that was driving that truck. Why? Because the way my life was turned upside down, I can only imagine his life being turned upside down. I had to continue. I would tell you, don't throw in the towel. Don't give up. You feel like you're alone. You feel like everything is going against you. The world is totally blacking out on you. Well, there's somebody holding you in their hand. That day, I, I shared this with a lot of people. I said, I, I feel God was hugging me because I didn't have any internal injuries. I didn't have any brain damage, only my limbs. And I figured, well, God was thinking, oh, that's a quick fix. I got good doctors that could take care of that. <laughs> but I believe he had me in his hand. I had to trust him. My family, yeah, they went through a lot. My three girls, one of the songs today was that something bad that the enemy has, something bad. Our oldest took care of me, and she is a paramedic today. Because of this bad thing that happened, God turned it into something good. So now she can save lives the same way those paramedics helped me. So it's something bad, it's something dark, it might be something ugly, it might be something that you're ready to just, oh, I'm done, I can't, God, why me? Well, he has a plan, he has a purpose. A lot of people would always tell me, there's a plan for your life, God, it wasn't your time. God has a purpose for your life. This is not your time. And I kept thinking, okay, God, what is my plan? I didn't understand. A couple of weeks ago, Michelle's dad, we were talking, and he said the same thing to me. God has a purpose for your life. There's a plan for your life. And in the back of my head, okay, God. But he didn't stop there. He said, to share your testimony, to share what God has done with you, to share what God has brought you. And I was able to understand then that God does have a plan. He does have a purpose. And today I'm here talking to you about God's grace, God's mercy, God's favor, God's miracles. Because without him, we can't move on. We can't take the next step. Amen. Isn't that amazing? You know, Romans, Romans 8.28 says this, and this is a very familiar verse of Scripture. I'm sure we've heard it, we've used it before, and I think sometimes we underestimate the power that God's Word can have in our lives. But just to remind you, in Romans 8.28 it says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good. God didn't cause those accidents. He didn't cause, you know, that landmine that, that was not, God did not orchestrate those events. You know, we live in a sinful, fallen world. 
But at the end of the day, God can take what maybe the enemy meant for evil to destroy your life and turn it around for the greater good. Because even through the setbacks, it still says God causes everything, everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for him. And so both of you have chosen to take something that truly was a setback. And one that, honestly, for most of us in this room, we can't really relate to because it's so extreme. But yet, what they did to overcome and to come back for one purpose, and that is to give glory to God and to honor Him and to tell the story of God's goodness and His faithfulness and His victory in your life is something that God is going to continue to use in ways that you could possibly never imagine. I remember we were having lunch um, Friday, and what's crazy is that sometimes people think their life is finished, and what's crazy is that God is never finished, amen? I mean, with God, all things are possible, and so who would have ever thought that the two of you would have to endure what you've had to endure? But now you've got a story to tell for his glory. And I just believe that God is going to use this for the greater good. And I believe that there are people in this room here today, you perhaps are on the verge of throwing in the towel. Some of you are going through situations and circumstances that are beyond perhaps your ability to deal with alone. And one of the things you shared with me the other day is that you were thankful for the fact that you did have people in your life. You were surrounded by a group of people who were there to pray with you and to walk through this journey with you. And I think it's so important that we realize just how valuable it is to have a group of people, a small group, to have people in your life that can walk through the setbacks with you because you don't want to try to overcome it alone. Yes, God is with us. But we're better together, we're stronger together. And that's the reason why doing life together is so vitally important. And I just believe that, listen, the best is still yet to come. And I want to close with this because I was blown away when you told me this the other day. So here you were enjoying running, you know, doing marathons and doing all these amazing things. And so in 2020, something is coming up. And you've set a goal to achieve something that I think is pretty awesome. Tell us about it. So I used to do with my daughters. We used to run the half marathons, princess half marathons through Disney. And um, February 2020, I signed up um, to run a 5K. 5K is a 3.1 miles. It's not much. But um, the brain is saying, hey, that's who you are. You can do this. Yeah, I kind of a couple of glitches in my legs and whatever. We can do this. Um, I've come this far. I know the Lord's going to help me through it. And um, life goes on, but we just have to hang on to one. And he's going to, I'm I'm trusting he's going to grab me by the hand. And even if he has to drag me through the finish line, but I'll make it. Yeah, awesome. And you keep running the race. Keep pushing, keep persevering. And, uh, and I am so thankful that, to, that the two of you are today, um, not just alive, but you are telling a story to share the hope that is found in Jesus Christ. Without him, we'd be nothing. And uh, Peter, do um, you have anything, last thing you want to say? Well, uh, let me tell you, uh, guys, if you really, really want to make a good comeback, you have to surround yourself with the right people. Uh, my setback and then my comeback was surrounded by not very good people. Uh, but when I met that little girl and I surrounded myself with the right people, it just made me stronger. I, I even forgot that I was missing my legs sometimes. I mean, I do things that people, you know, wonder how in the world did he just do that? Um, I don't do it alone. It's the people around me, you know. Uh, so I'm sorry, Pastor, but I'm going to pull out my book. Oh, that's good. Great. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. But um, if you guys want to hear the rest of it or see the rest of the story, I got my book back there. You can read the book. Uh, also, tomorrow is Veterans Day. 
So if you want to give that to a veteran, I think it's very good for veterans. It's a motivational book. So if you, uh, if you want to buy it, go ahead and buy it. Awesome. Yes. He made, really quick, he made mention to an 11-year-old girl. Her name is um, Lynette. We named our youngest daughter Lynette in honor to her, for her. She's still part of our lives. She actually married his, um, her sister married his brother. So we still connected, we still talk, we still have a relationship with that young lady who's a woman now, a mother, and a director in a hospital as a nurse. Um, God has just brought everything together, everything in place. So that little 11 year old girl that talked to him, she did what God had put her to do. You bring your children to church, continue to bring them. Don't give up because God puts that seed in there, that 11 year old girl, there's fruit there. Amen. Isn't that incredible? The power of an invitation. <laughs>